Well, one of the sectors in the Indian economy which has shown remarkable growth over the last several years and is really closely aligned, some would suggest, with India's economic progress going forward is the aviation sector. Now, there are plenty of challenges there, but there is plenty of hope and plenty of promise. We've got uh, the Civil Aviation Minister with us, Jyotiraditya Sindhya. We are both extremely passionate about aviation. Great to have you. Let me ask you a direct question and ask you for some years or dates in mind. We want India to become an international aviation hub like Singapore, like Dubai, like Doha. Given the pace and the growth, how many more years would that likely take in your estimate? So first of all, Vishnu, thank you very much for having me. It's always a pleasure to be on the show with you. Uh, <clears throat> aviation has uh, really uh, 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 started on its growth curve uh, now in India. Uh, I think a market that was uh, uh, very saturated on the domestic front, uh, the growth of both on the one hand uh, airports uh, from 74 airports in 2014 to 149. I just inaugurated the, a new airport three days ago in Utkela in Orissa. Uh, so we are at 149 airports now, not 148. Uh, in terms of fleet size uh, from 400 to 700. Um, and in terms of the number of travelers from 6 crores to almost 14 and a half crores. What are the projections going forward? The projections going forward are, as far as airports are concerned, touching 200 to 220 by 2030. Uh, as far as um, uh, planes are concerned, going from our current fleet size of 700 to almost about 1500 yeah. uh, by 2030. And similarly, as far as passengers are concerned, uh, going from current 14.5 crores to some studies have projected almost 42.5 crores by 2030. Now that's the phenomenal growth that you see. When that happens, and specifically that must happen on the international side, yeah. uh, because until now our carriers have been very concentrated on growing capacity on the domestic side yes. and therefore narrowed body aircraft. You've now seen uh, carriers like Air India, Indigo uh, place orders for uh, 470 aircraft on one hand and 500 aircraft on the other. Uh, both orders comprising of a decent amount of, uh, on the one hand, large body with Boeing and Airbus with Air India. And uh, as far as Indigo is concerned with A321 XLRs, which can do a distance of almost six, seven hours. Now, once that happens, then the concept of an international hub also becomes uh, a, a uh, I wouldn't want to say a low-hanging fruit, but an opportunity for India. India for too long has had its hub either on its eastern border or western border. We're currently working uh, with uh, uh, Dial uh, to look at setting up a uh, hub in Delhi mm -hmm. to start with. But what I feel uh, is in the next uh, decade or so, the capability of India to have not necessarily only a single hub, but multiple hubs, yes. one in Delhi, one in South India, uh, one on Western, the Western side, uh, that capability certainly is there. But I think we need to start with one, um, uh, engage and make sure that the proof of concept takes off. And once that does happen, uh, then replicate that going forward. Uh, too many of our uh, travelers today go via a third yeah, country a and, and, I, and I think it's important to instead of six freedom you're really looking at direct flights yes. uh, and therefore creating that hub structure within India. So to answer my question five years before we get at least one truly global hub given the pace of expansion or ten years? Well, where I, I think, think you, could, you, could, you could look at a, a road map of five years uh, I would want it to be sooner but I'm not going to divulge a date uh, closer than five years I believe that uh, I think it's important to uh, undercommit and over deliver as opposed to over committing and under delivering. All right. So, so five years, that's, that's an interesting statistic nonetheless. At one level, there is pressure, and I use that word loosely, on you because we've got the companies coming up with massive orders. They're banking on the Indian economy, they're banking on your ministry. Can your ministry match the infrastructure requirements required for a thousand plus aircraft? within, let's say, the next decade, easily. Uh, and by that, it's parking bays, it's space for engineering, ground support, um, physical space in airports. What are you doing to match the demand which exists? 
So I think that it's a very important question and I think uh, the uh, always the toss up is do you put the cart before the horse or the horse before the cart and I think it's important to create capacity uh, and which is why uh, you've seen the scorching pace at which uh, uh, Prime Minister's government in the last nine years has gone from 74 airports to 149 airports, water drones and heliports. Yeah. And when I give you a target of 200 to 20 plus uh, by 2030, mm -hmm. you're looking at a capacity addition of almost 50% more from the current level, right? So that's the kind of pace that we're looking at. Now, when you talk about throughput capability, uh, and I think there your question is centered really on the on the metros. Yes. Uh, if you look at Delhi Airport today, we have a throughput capability of 70 million. Yes. That capability is going to go to 109 million come this December. What does that mean? That means that Delhi is going to become one of the largest airports in the world. Not in the subcontinent, not in Asia, but in the world. We are going to be, if at all second, only two in Atlanta. Right. right? So that's the kind of scale you're looking at. In the next uh, 12 months, you will have the uh, inauguration of Jaywar Airport yes. at almost 12 million, which will grow, grow in its capacity by 2030 to almost 60 million right. there. So between these two airports, you're going to have close to about 160 million throughput capability. Bombay is capped out already at about 50, 60 million. Yes. Uh, Navi Mumbai is coming up, which will grow to another 50, 60 million. Chennai, we are uh, growing capacity from 25 million to almost about 45 million. Uh, similar is the case in Hyderabad. Uh, Calcutta at 35 million going to 55 million. Right. So therefore, current six metro capacity in India, which is in the range of about 220 million throughput capability, is going to go to almost 430 million uh, in the next four to five years. So uh, in terms of uh, being able to cater to growing passengers, I think that's something that we have already planned for. Having said that, the private sector and the public sector has a very aggressive infrastructure capex plan in place, uh, close to about 98,000 crores yes. over the next three to five years, uh, of which Airports Authority of India has a capex plan of roughly 25,000 crores, and the balance 63,000 crores is the private sector. Uh, uh, AI is going to look at uh, expansion of almost 42 brownfield airports and three greenfield airports out of which one has already been built up in terms of Holongi. Uh, similarly, the private sector in their 63,000 crore capex is looking at seven greenfield, uh, brownfield airports and uh, two greenfield airports out of which Mopagoa, three greenfield airports out of which Mopagoa has already been built yes. out and Jaywar and Navi Mumbai are being built out. So there's a huge thrust. Uh, in civil aviation uh, and I believe uh, and I'm putting a, uh, uh, my neck out there on the line but I believe in the next decade or so uh, uh, civil aviation is going to become bulwark of transportation uh, in India for a large number of people uh, even larger than just uh, the first AC and second AC of railways because our, our, our competition is a AC product by yes. the very nature of the fact that an air, uh, aircraft is air conditioned. Delhi Airport, you said, will become the second largest in the world in a finite period of if time. Not, if not the largest. By when? By, by this December. December. By, by this December. 109 million. You will, you will be the second largest airport Correct. in the world. And Correct. you are set to exceed Atlanta in a period going forward. Sure. Whenever but, that happens. But I'm, but I'm just saying you'll, you'll be at 109 million capacity by December, Jan. We'll talk about airfares in just a bit because that's an important point that you raised. But there are smaller airlines in India which are struggling to survive. There's a, le there's a battle with a legal battle SpiceJet is going through. Go first is, uh, you know, I mean, in financial distress, barely exists right now, technically exists. Is this shake up in the industry, which a lot of people said would likely take place? Isn't that a bad thing for the customer? Because if you have a duopoly type situation, uh, uh, you know, I mean, two very large airlines, then fares would likely go up. Well, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, economic basis of your statement, uh, it's unfounded. Uh, by its very nature, the aviation business is a very inelastic mm. business in terms of pricing. Uh, the minute you start raising prices, your demand drops off a cliff. So it's not an elastic market. Right. Um, that being said, 
as civil aviation minister, I would like to have a minimum of five, four to five players in the space. Akasa is a strong third, in fact, so I should actually so, make that. So I was just going to come to that. So while we do talk about the airlines which are undergoing some issues at this point of time, um, and that is pertaining to their way of doing business uh, and not the industry in itself. So there's very little that one can do to intervene, uh, whether they are contractual issues or whether they're the legal issues. Uh, for the first time in over two decades, you've seen a new airline being born yeah. in India in the form of a casa. And you've seen that fledgling, nestling airline go from two aircraft yeah. to 20 aircraft in a period of 12 months. Yeah. Now that's a record, yeah. right? Across the world, that's a record. So my hat's off to them in terms of how they've, they've grown their capacity. They also have a very ambitious target of going to almost 70 airplanes in the next uh, three to four right. years. Um, having said that, Vishnu, also I think it's important for you to concentrate on the smaller aircraft, the regional airlines. Uh, Udan, uh, the Ude Desh Kaam Nagri scheme, has not only connected people, has not only connected cities, mm -hmm. but it has, uh, in its wake, given birth to three to four new airlines in this country. Fly 91 was born because of Uran. Fly Big has been born because of Uran. India One Air has been born because of Uran. Star Air has been born because of Uran. And so therefore you are going to see, a, you're seeing a huge spurt in regional connectivity to not tier one to tier two, but really tier, tier two to tier three and tier three to even tier four uh, cities with um, nine seater aircraft and three seater aircraft. And that's the uh, revolution that is going to be unfolding itself in India over the next couple of years as well. But let me ask, there is a CAG report so which has come be, out. So there will be a hub and spoke sure. arrangement where a lot of these smaller regional airlines and smaller aircraft will feed onto the tier two cities, which will then be taken on by the narrowed bodied aircraft to tier one and, and other cities. Yeah. And, and so, so that's, that's the change. change. But, you know, be, be, be direct as you always are with us. Are you somewhat disappointed at the pace at which uh, Uran has developed as a scheme because if you look at the CAG report, 52% of awarded regional routes could not commence operations. Only 30% of regional routes which commenced ops have completed three years during the initial period. We so wanted think, a lot more, so I, I think. I think, Vishnu, uh, in life, uh, you can always say a glass is half full or a glass is half empty, right? Uh, the fact that the scheme was born in 2016. Yes. Uh, it's only been seven years. And the fact that you have 495 routes that have connected people that were never ever connected yes. by civil aviation yes. in this country ever before. The fact that cities that were on the civil aviation map in World War II and were obliterated from that map soon after World War II are now being reconnected by civil aviation. Case in point for you is a city on the western coast of, uh, uh, of uh, on the eastern coast of Orissa, Jharsuguda, mm -hmm. Rupsi in Assam, Kishangarh in, in Rajasthan, Darbanga in Bihar, all completely unconnected. Third point, the fact that four regional airlines have been born because of Uran. There was no way they would they would have they would have even come into existence if Uran had not been in place, if a viability gap funding uh, principle had not been mm -hmm. in place. Fourth point, the fact that through Uran you have built out 74 airports, 74 airports in this country on a regional basis have been built out because of the funding from Uran, four and a half thousand crores. Utkela was the last one which yes. I inaugurated, right? But why? So have, why is so so mm -hmm. so? When you roll out a scheme, the scheme has to have, people like yourselves have always argued that there must be a sunset clause. Yes. So every scheme has to have a sunset clause, sure. right? And so Uran has a sunset clause of three years, yes. that I will give you this viability gap funding for three years, so you will, you will be able to fly that route based on my VGF for three years. Post that, either it becomes viable and carries on, or if it doesn't, then we've got to look at other routes. Right. Right? 
And the fact that you've got at least close to about 25 to 30 percent of those routes today becoming sustainable in terms of eventual routes, right? That itself is a huge feather in the cap for civil aviation. And all the four points that I mentioned to you, which would have never happened, the very fact today that through Uran you have carried 1 crore 31 lakh passengers in this country in the last seven years who would have never flown no. in an aircraft. No, I agree. I right? agree. And these numbers... And, you, and you've had 234,000, sure. 2 lakh 34,000 flights through Uran, which would have never happened. No, but I understand this. And these numbers are absolutely correct. I'm just trying to understand why have many of those routes not worked? There have been many reasons. And is it the airline? So is there have been many capacity? reasons. Many, many times the airline has bid and then has decided yes. not to ply that route. Yes. Many times uh, the airline has started a route and then it's had some, because it had only one aircraft and the aircraft had an engineering problem and it went, it, it uh, uh, got uh, uh, grounded and therefore it's not been able to finish that route. So what we've done this time around, the two changes that I've brought about uh, in Udan. Number one, I have moved from uh, ATR aircraft, which was the smallest aircraft at that point of time, 72-seater, to small aircraft and helicopters. So yes. I've created specific Udan routes, uh, Udan rounds, 5.1 and 5.2, and before that I think it was 4.1 for helicopters and small planes to connect uh, your nine-seaters, your helicopters. We've got almost about 25 routes in Uttarakhand that are operational today on helicopters, about nine routes in uh, Himachal, uh, about close to 16 to 18 routes in the northeast mm -hmm. uh, on helicopter. Small aircraft, we are, we've got the round going on as we speak, which is 5.2. That's the one tweak that we've done. The second tweak that we are, we are contemplating and thinking of doing is we're going to put in place a, uh, a structure such that if you come in and bid for a route and then you do not ply that route, maybe in two months or three months, there is some kind of a penalty on you sure. as well, right? And that will wean out the not-so-serious players and make sure only the serious players actually right. come in and bid for those routes. Yeah. So we are doing that as we, as we go along as well. Yeah. There was criticism, and I think a part of it was somewhat unfounded, on airfares going up massively. The other thing that we are yeah. also thinking of doing is right now Uran is uh, limited to 500 kilometers or 600 kilometers yeah. in terms of uh, distance. So, uh, therefore, what you do by doing that is you actually limit your, your radial, right. you limit your radius. So, you can that. So, so, what we are thinking of doing is saying you can fly as far as you want. And this is still on the drawing board. But the VGF, the viability yeah. gap funding, will be only be for that 500 off, let's say, for example, a 1,000 kilometer right. route. Only the 500. So you're tweaking mission around. So That's your message. tweak it to make it to more make attractive. It, yeah. Not, not to make it more attractive, to, to give a variability, to make it more uh, viable and to draw in more players. Okay. Um, you know, there was this period a couple of months back where um, last minute fares went up massively in yeah. only a handful of sectors. Uh, and the argument which was raised that, look, you know, these, these prices are, uh, are huge. Uh, but they did settle within days, in fact, almost in all cases. So, so, so to what extent does the government need to be involved in regulating so, fares so or first, should it? So, first of all, uh, civil aviation is a deregulated sector. So, the government cannot regulate right. a deregulated sector. Having said that, what happened uh, in June yeah. was uh, a, if you will, a spike or an anomaly. Two things coincided at the same time. Go first was what, right? No. The first is that the civil aviation sector is a, uh, a cyclical sector within a year. Mm -hmm. So you have high season and low season. So and therefore you have high prices and low prices. From uh, the Sera, which is October until Jan, is high season. Uh, where you have a lot of people traveling. Demand goes up, prices go up. And this is an international phenomena. Uh, Thanksgiving, New Year's, Christmas, all of that internationally. Then you have low season from Feb till about uh, April, May. Then the summer holidays come. And so you have high season again until monsoon. And then from July till September again is low season. So it's a cyclical in terms of prices and demand, one affecting the other. Now what happened is you normally have this cycle. But in between of a high season, 
you also had an airline with almost 30 aircraft being grounded. Right. So capacity got sucked out of the system. Sure. So A, you had high demand yeah. and then you had almost uh, close to a 5 to 7 percent drawdown on capacity. Sure. So you had a double whammy right. happen at the same time. Right. And therefore, you had certain cities which were primarily connected by, yeah. by Go. Srinagar, for example. Leh, Srinagar, uh, Pune, yeah. uh, Ahmedabad, Goa, uh, which had an abnormal rise in fares. And so we had a meeting on the 5th of June, and I called in the airlines, uh, and I said that this is not tenable, and this is not right. And we had, a, we had a very free and frank discussion. And soon after that, we actually saw, and I started monitoring the prices on a daily basis, and you saw the normalization of fares happen. All right, one final question, heliports. Um, helicopter aviation in this country is still fledgling. Uh, you've spoken briefly about that. Uh, what more do you think needs to be done to encourage helicopter aviation in India? So what we've done is uh, uh, we've done, taken a number of steps. So first of all, I brought about a new helicopter policy yeah. where I dismantled a lot of the regulatory uh, uh, conditions, making it easier for people to, f uh, to fly helicopters um, in terms of permissions. And, and uh, we put up a, a heli portal for permissions, direct permissions. We circulated a heli disha booklet to all 600 collectors across the country. Uh, to make them understand the parameters that a helipad must have, what are the radial distances from obstructions that should be in place. Uh, and along with that, we started bringing out this new um, Udan round just for helicopters. And we've actually seen a proliferation of that happen. Uh, uh, I firmly believe that now as people are getting used to, and we also have a VGF system, yeah. so therefore earlier you had helicopter travel available to you, but it was away from your, sure. your budget and my budget. Now with this VGF, you actually brought the prices down to almost three and a half or 4,000 rupees for a particular sector, Badrinath, Kedarnath and so on and so forth, or the Northeast, for example. And therefore now people are availing of these facilities. And I, will, I think there will be a growth in both helicopter fleet as well as plying uh, in, the, in the days to come. Uh, as soon as this Udan uh, round is, uh, is I didn't up. ask you about uh, flight safety. Uh, I know it's a huge, huge issue for you, perhaps top of your mind. Um, you know, there is this issue of Buddhist passengers, and it's not unique to India. It happens all over the world. Correct. That said, you know, we have to set a very firm signal. Do you believe that the system in putting people on a no-fly list is strong enough? Do you, are you constantly revising that? What have been some of your conversations with airlines in this regard? So as far as uh, unruly passengers are concerned, uh, uh, that's a, uh, a wild card, if you will, yeah, if I may use that term. Uh, because no one knows how you or I are going to behave when we board a flight. But having said that, I think it's important to, as you said, uh, to set uh, examples and to set precedents. And we have been extremely strong on coming down on any unruly passenger on any of our airlines. Uh, whether it is through following the legal process, whether it is putting that person on a no-fly list for an extended period of time, and so on and so forth. Whatever uh, 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 processes we have at our command, we use those completely to make sure that when you fly, you're not only responsible for yourself, you're responsible for everyone else on that flight. And then you need to board that plane with that sense of responsibility. Sure. Wonderful speaking to you, Minister. Uh, Jyotir Aditya Sindhya telling us a lot about the future uh, of uh, this particular sector. It is tremendous. There are no two ways about it. It's really a question of when India becomes even larger than we are in terms of becoming a truly global hub. Uh, but the potential is incredible. Uh, the demand is also incredible. There's so much to discuss in this. We'll take a short break, come back with a lot more.